Now we'll hear from, from Peter um, on what has been happening in the, what has been happening in the OECD. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak from here. I don't have a presentation. I thank you very much, Courtney, for your introduction. Yes, I'm, for the last uh, year and a half, I've been chair of the OECD SEA task team. And for those who have not heard of that acronym, it's, uh, it's a subset of Environet, which is a high-level ministerial sort of level committee within the Development Assistance Committee of, of uh, OECD. So we are a, a voluntary group of people, uh, about 80 uh, impact and uh, strategic environmental assessment practitioners belong to the task team. Some of them are in the room, and maybe, maybe those that are in the room can just raise their hand to show you, you might be sitting beside a task team member. Excellent. So uh, they're good people, and some of them play music and like to dance, and uh, <laughs> Rob is shaking his head. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to get at, at some of the things we've been doing on climate change and strategic environmental assessment. My, I've got some discrete notes about the task team itself, and then I'm going to open up my, my remarks to a larger view of where I think SEA within a development cooperation community needs to go, and I guess when we'll have uh, questions and so on. First thing is that the, the task team was mandated to develop in 2004 a guidance document on SEA and development cooperation, which is on the web. You can get that. I'll give the website in a second. Subsequent to that, we developed four advisory notes. Some have already been snapped up. I brought 50 for the conference, and they're already gone. There's a poster there that you can get. But we, had a, we developed advisory notes on SEA and uh, climate change, an advisory note on disaster risk reduction, ecosystem services, and post-conflict. So if you're messing about in those fields, there's some good information to get at seataskteam.net. And that's where all the information is. Soon to be released is a report, a massive uh, bit of research that's been done over the last two years on how SEA and impact assessment has been uh, contributed to poverty reduction. It's a progress report on the practice of SEA and climate change as part of that. And coupled with that is there's a lot of work being done by the German uh, cooperation unit, GTZ, who do, on behalf of the OECD uh, task team, trainings on SEA and also training courses on strategic environmental assessment and climate change. So that's the, sort of the first half of the public service announcement about the OECD task team. Where are we going with, uh, with the, some of this information I've just discussed? Well, I'm pleased to say that there's been uptake of the guidance note on climate change and SCA in Mozambique. There is a, a regional study going on right now by a consulting team in the Mozambican government. It's not finished yet, but when that report is out, I'm sure it'll be uh, available to anybody uh, in the world. But the, the word is that the, the, the guidance on uh, SCA and uh, climate change has been of use to the Mozambican government and the, the, uh, the, consultancy, the consultancy that's doing this work. And um, the reason for this is because the private sector is involved. The Mozambique uh, government wants to develop a certain part of the country, and private sector is very uh, interested in this area. And prior to making these critical decisions, they want to have a look at how climate change is going to affect investments in this area. So there is that uh, to watch for when it's uh, finished. Also, there's a huge uptake uh, of climate change and SEA in Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Indonesia, and in fact, there's about 60 countries around the world that are messing about in the field of, of SEA and, uh, and climate change. So there's a tremendous amount of work going on. And my message to you now is about how we need to move this, this, uh, this practice forward from a development cooperation perspective, but also from a larger orbit of, of all of us in the room and our colleagues back home. It's moving into risk. That's where I see it's going. It's been discussed this morning, and I want to build on that. There's a Nature article that came out last year, and I invite anybody that uh, can get to it. I can send you the link if you want to email me. I don't have the author, uh, but it's, it's, an art it's an article about what keeps us alive. And there's nine planetary processes which essentially keep, keep us all breathing and, and, and having kids and having a good life. And Pardon the interruption. Yes. Your conference contains less than three participants at this time. If you would like to, you press. <laughs> or the I thought that was going to be a question from the floor already. I thought, <laughs> wow, people are listening. <laughs> anyway, of the nine planetary processes, three have been exceeded. It's a very interesting graph to have a look at. The carbon cycle exceeded. Biodiversity uh, reduction exceeded. Nitrogen loading on our land and waters exceeded. 
two that are moving up to the, to the red line are uh, water shortages and uh, ocean acidification. And of all of those, ocean, ocean acidification seems to be the one that's most unknown, uncertain, and is, has actually caused an oceanographer, when she learned of this data, to leave the conference and was sick to her stomach. So uh, there's, you know, there's something happening out there. So we're, we're moving into a realm of risk and uncertainty, which has probably never been seen before in our own uh, societies. The insurance companies are looking at, at this in a very, very, very big way. You just have to look at what happened to Katrina, what happened in Pakistan, and, and the various events, water events, drought events around the world. I invite you to have a look at the, a document called the Sigma Catastrophe List. It's what the insurance companies use to monitor catastrophes and expenditures for insurance losses. It's growing exponentially. So the question that I throw out to, to, to you is where does SEA fit in management of risk and investments? The, another website which I really invite you to have a look at, if you haven't seen it before, is teabweb.org, which is the, the value of ecosystems, goods and services. And there is a lot of work being done on, well, really, what is, you know, one acre of mangrove worth? You know, we've, we've heard these arguments, right? Well, they're becoming very, very significant. People are starting to listen to this. The value of ecosystem, goods and services left intact has more value in total economic value than turning it into a piece of plywood or something. So tweb.org is, is having a, a, a lot of study about this, and the banks and insurance companies are now moving in onto this because they're seeing it as banks want to get their, their, their pro, the banks want to make sure that their investments are repaid, and insurance companies want to make sure that their investments aren't just flooded in, in the next five years. In fact, this, this whole idea of one in a hundred year risk event is probably no longer attainable. It's probably one in a 10-year event that we have to start thinking about. So the insurance companies, the banks, are now looking at this to see, well, if risk is an issue and ecosystem of goods and services are, are part of this, then how do we factor it into our national accounts? And that's where the World Bank is moving right now. Just a couple of weeks ago, the World Bank announced that they're developing a, a program to look at how uh, country programs can integrate ecosystem services into the national accounts. This is exactly where we want to go. So as, as impact assessment practitioners, as SEA practitioners, anybody that's in the room here needs to sort of call up your, your World Bank friend and say, we want to be part of that. We want to be part of, of showing you how SEA can be part of integrating ecosystem goods and services in national accounts. So really what we're looking at here is, is national capital uh, is being eroded, and that's a risk issue, and trying to understand all of this in the post-economic collapse, which is not over, and climate change effects, which are now starting to happen. So the message that I'm hearing from my contacts in insurance companies and banks is that the ecosystem goods and services free ride is no longer uh, tenable, that it's becoming central to investment analysis, the cost of goods of ecosystem services. And what's interesting is that the people that are picking up on this are the companies and institutions in developing countries and less so in developed countries. And I really, you know, you might wonder, well, why is that? It's because the Sierra Leones of the world, the Tanzanias of the world, the, the Pakistans of the world know that their economics, goods and services come from their back door. And if those, uh, if those services are lost due to climate change or any kind of uh, problems, with economic system function, then their GDPs, GNPs, quality of life, all those sorts of things, human development indices, are going to go south very quickly. I invite you to have a look at, again, when we, it's been mentioned probably in every talk, and I'm going to mention it again, is this business of reaching out to getting out of our silos. The UNEP has launched uh, over the last number of while, last few years, the, the finance initiative, UNEP finance initiative, and again, all of us in this room need to be part of that because that is exactly where UNEP is going. They're talking to finance companies, they're talking to insurance companies, they're talking to banks and discussing risk when it comes to environment. And who are we when it gets down to the bare bones? We are risk managers. We're trying to deal with uncertainty. And so we really have to reach out to UNEP to have a look at that. And getting down to even uh, UNEP is launching the GEO plus five process 
Everybody needs to be part of the Geo Plus 5 process. And I don't know if there's been Geo 1, Geo 2, Geo 3, and 4. Well, Geo 5 has been launched. And whoever is managing your Geo process in your own respective countries, you need to make sure you've got some messages about SEA impact assessment in that. Um, also, what's coming up is Rio Plus 20. That's looming in the next year, year and a half, two years. All of us need to feed information, messages, to your counterparts in your own respective institutions that's managing the, the text development for negotiations going into Rio Plus 20. Where does SEA fit? We have to make sure there's some paragraphs about SEA in Rio Plus 20, Geo Plus 5 as well. Um, one of the key messages coming from some of the, the, the case studies, which you'll hear this afternoon at 2 o'clock, there's going to be a session just on OECD work on case studies, is that we really have to look at this business of uncertainty and critical thresholds for decision making. You know, the, the island that we live on is getting smaller. It's getting smaller and it's getting hotter. It's getting wetter, it's getting drier. You know, all the things that we are familiar with over the last hundred years is changing very rapidly. And Bob mentioned all these statistics this morning to show us that, you know, that what we call Turtle Island in North America is, uh, is changing very quickly. So our task then from an SEA perspective is two things, I think, is reaching out to UNEP in the finance initiative, reaching out to banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, fantastic, I'm glad you're here. You know, city, actually. Oh, city. Well, <laughs> J.P. Morgan should be here. Anyway, we had some J.P. Morgan people at, uh, in Geneva, and uh, they were engaged on this uh, from a risk management perspective. I'm sorry about that, but uh, we'll talk. Um, so I'm glad the private sector from the banking side is here because that, the messages I'm, I'm relaying is really core to what we're trying to do is manage risk and to make sure the investments you make and make sh uh, you know, you get return on your investment and it's not sort of swallowed up by some huge uh, typhoon uh, and, and, and the issues of climate change. So the core issue is coordinated solutions for decision making. We as impact assessment people are married to this practice. You know, some of us have been involved in it for probably 20, 25 years, and we think it's the center of the universe. Well, it's not the center of the universe. It's part of the universe. Money is at the center of the universe more and more. Unfortunately, you know, we may say, you know, human beings are at the center. Of course, people are at the center of this and what's happening in, with the poor and so on. We have, to, we have to deal with that and turn things around. But it all revolves around money. And the economic collapse is shown that it can disappear very quickly, and climate change is showing that the risk to investments can disappear very quickly. So SEA has a, has, a, has a role to play there. I'd like to think of us as a closing comment, is that all of us in this room are, are somewhat like mosquitoes. Now, some people have said, you know, mosquitoes, if, you, if you've been in bed with a mosquito, you think, well, you know, let's, you know, you can be very tiny and be very, very effective and just being trying to go to sleep with one mosquito, you can see how bothersome one can be. And I would like to think that all of us become more of a cloud of mosquitoes out there and really get in the face of, of banks, insurance companies in a, in a proactive way, not in a, in a bothering way, but bring positive messages to these people who may not know that we exist, who may not know that this practice exists, to show them that there is a way of, of providing investment, providing uh, securities which in the face of economic collapse and climate change and provide a way forward that is, is a bit more sustainable. Thank you very much.